Yeah. So, good afternoon. And there is a paper version here. And I could send it to those of you who would like to look into it afterwards. I'll abbreviate it and make it shorter to have some time for discussion in, in uh, this uh, connection. So, in this paper, I shall give a normative justification of the legal protection of freedom of expression. And this will be done by an analysis of presuppositions of three modern institutions, namely democracy, truth-seeking, and individual autonomy. And moreover, I shall discuss a main ambiguity of the term offense, namely the difference between offense in terms of negative feelings and offense in terms of indoctrination and brainwashing. So, in accordance with a generally accepted view, I shall emphasize three elements of such a normative notion of freedom of expression. Personal autonomy through the free formation of opinions by the individual, joint search for better understanding of public questions, and deliberative democracy. So in a condensed formulation, we may speak of autonomous person, search for truth, and deliberative democracy. Though these terms are certainly ambiguous and need to be explicated. First, the notion autonomous person, mündige Person. I happened to write this paper in German. I talked with Alois, and he said, Georg should be around, so I wrote it. And then I have used Google to get it in English. You'll see how it's <laughs> Well, also, first, first point, auton autonomous person. So when I hear speak of a personal autonomy, I do not have, I do not operate with an idealized picture of autonomous persons, nor with an idealized model of human individuals endowed with innate pre-political rights. What I have in mind is a rather sober idea of ideas who are sufficiently reasonable and fallible at the same time. Pre precisely because such persons are reasonable as well as fallible, it is vital to have an open and enlightened exchange of ideas and opinions based on freedom of expression. We are fallible, we see in part, as it is said in the Holy Scripture, and therefore we need to expose ourselves to counter-arguments and alternative perspectives. I quote a text that might be well known to some of you. There is a greatest difference between presuming the opinion, an opinion to be true, because with every opportunity of contesting it, it has not been refuted, and assuming that it's truth for the purpose of not permitting its refutation. Complete liberty of contradicting and disproving our opinion is a very condition which justifies us in assuming its truth for purposes of action, and on no other terms can a being with human faculties have any rational assurance of being right. End of quotation, John Stuart Mill from On Liberty. It's decisive that freedom of expression is indispensable for such persons who are fallible as well as reasonable. That's the first point. Second point now search for truth. And here when we talk about freedom of expression, we rely upon this argumentation as given by John Stuart Mill. So if we want to know whether a position we consider to be well-founded really is well-founded, we need to know the counter-arguments. Being rational and reasonable, Persons, we seek to find our way through complicated matters, and uh, we have no other way than a free and open exchange of opinions, whereby different views are tried out, one against the other, and where relevant research results are discussed critically. Hence, freedom of expression is not <coughs> merely a preference, a value along with other values on the same level, as it were, but the prerequisite without which we can't reach reasonable views. For us, 
citizens in modern societies who want to be able to distinguish between more or less tenable and untenable views on complicated matters, freedom of expression is an indispensable condition. So this argument and its strength, it has two aspects, as it were. On the one hand, it's rooted in the negative self-reference, the self-referential inconsistency that occurs when we try to deny the necessity of knowing relevant counter-arguments to our own truth claims. On the other hand, it is located in the fact that the fallible search for truth represent a basic feature in modern science-based societies. Look at the university. People are doing very different things. Some in the lab, some in the field, some in the laboratory. But at the end, they do one thing. They argue for the thesis, finding better reasons against less good reasons. That seems to be something that's common. Whatever much time we use and whatever how fallible that kind of activity might be. So, since we are fallible, in order to have confidence in our own views, that is, in what we by now hold to be the best founded view, we need to listen to other persons and to be open to their arguments and modes and reflection. For this to happen, all participants have to be able to express themselves freely. Freedom of expression is a precondition, a necessary but not a sufficient condition. I'll come back to that at the end. But other conditions are also to be met. For instance, serious discussions presuppose that participants recognize each other as reasonable and fallible persons. Hence, we have a moral norm. It is a prerequisite for such discussions that participants recognize each other as equal in this sense of being sufficiently reasonable and fallible. So, that's a decisive point. To promote a joint search for better points of view on issues of public importance, freedom of expression is essential. And to undermine this freedom is a violation against this kind of argumentation. That's the second point. Third point now, deliberative democracy. When we speak of deliberative democracy, we have or I have at least in mind, a modern representative democracy based on free election as a majority rule, the ordinary view, but also on an institutional system and a political culture whereby issues of public interest are discussed freely and fairly in the public sphere. And look upon the possibilities of that in the next presentation. <laughs> yeah. um, all well-functioning democracies have compulsory school education. That is not accidental. Legal adults as citizens, better in German, mündige Staatsbürger in modern society democracies ought to be adequately educated and enlightened since they do have a co-responsibility for the choices. So this, I would claim, is an institution inherent norm related to the role. In other words, then I bring the things together, within the notion of a deliberative democracy, the notion of reasonable and fallible persons, and the notion of joint search for better points of view on public questions are already included. Thus, the three notions form a whole. Reasonable, fallible persons in joint search by free and enlightened discussions and opinion formation, ideally, to obtain reasonable common views on is issues that are publicly relevant. Hence, freedom of expression is indispensable. If we want to have democracy, we have to insist on freedom of expression. So these three interwoven notions taken together, in my view, that is, autonomous personhood, joint search for better understanding of public affairs and deliberative democracy, they represent, taken together, a strong justification, in my view, of the legal protection of freedom of expression. Now, here the main concern is that of discursive utterances in the public sphere about public affairs. 
these are the utterances that, according to this definition, are primarily protected by these arguments. But from these paradigmatic cases, there are gradual transitions to other types of utterances, themes, and arenas. Or, of course, utterances that are protected under the principle of freedom of expression could, at the outset, be defined more widely and vaguely. However, this is a decisive point from my point of view here, in praxis, we nevertheless have to differentiate between different utterances with regard to how much legal protection they deserve. Therefore, in my opinion, it's better to start from a more precise and well-founded notion of freedom of expression, which can then, and which should then, be followed up by public discussions and legal considerations concerning the degree of legal tolerance and legal protection that the various other utterances deserve in their contexts and institutions. I skip some of the notes on that issue and I go to the, the other important question which is the limits to freedom of expression. Taking this definition, what are the limits? Very often if you start with a common view that all actions should be free, you start head on on, on, on harm and, and offense and that kind of thing. Well, as typical limitations to legal, the legal right of freedom of expression, we have the question of where and how to evaluate this fundamental right first in the face of the danger of political chaos and fatal instability. And second, with respect to various cases of offense, insult, and harm. First, political chaos or fatal instability. The positive answer to the first question, that is limits set to freedom of expression due to a danger of political chaos and fatal instability, should in any case be well-founded and well-justified so far as possible with regard to the question, what can society tolerate here and now? Which and how many provocative statements? Let's consider a few examples. The official Chinese response to the utterances of Liu Chabu has been heavily criticized. Suppression of free expressions by an authoritarian regime. Yes, certainly. But how could we possibly reconstruct arguments for these drastic measures? I guess. The political leaders are afraid of, of social instability, if that kind of criticism goes on. Generally speaking, the political elite in China is afraid of losing control, or perhaps not just about their power, but about the stability of the regime. Consider the fate of the Soviet Union. Consider the bitter experiences from Chinese history. Then the question, nervousness for the stability of this regime or for the state and nation. Stability and chaos. If that were the case, would then the party, seen from the inside, have sufficient grounds to limit the freedom of expression of a city, fellow citizens, with such drastic measures? Another case. Consider Julian Assange, or Snowden, or Van Unen. Through WikiLeaks, Julian Assange published numerous statements from the North American Security Service. Washington reacted sharply. According to Hillary Clinton, Assange has not only done harm to North American security, but also to the international community. Washington demanded his extradition to bring Assange before the court in the US. 
It is as in warfare, first comes national security and then, if possible, international control. The freedom of expression of fellow citizens come, comes second. In these cases, the problem is that it is often unclear which consequences a particular utterance will have. The attempt to predict politically fatal effects is problematic, already because human actions and their consequences are never fully predictable. We are thus entering an ambiguous field in which we are faced with questions such as the following. If an Israeli in Hebron shows off a poster on which the prophet is portrayed as a pig, to what extent can we then know whether this utterance would lead to an escalation of the conflict and eventually to an intensified warfare in the Middle East? When Western politicians conceived the Muhammad cartoons as difficult and frustrating, it was perhaps not only because of emotional insults felt by many Muslims, but also, and perhaps primarily, of fear for increasing conflicts and political instability. In short, in modern risk societies, Almost everything, at least potentially, is associated with risk. If you ask, what utterances, verbal or non-verbal, could and should be prohibited as a protection against possible political chaos and instability, but at the expense of the freedom of expression, then we do indeed raise a notoriously difficult question. However, all in all, this means, I would say, that we should normally proceed from the assumption of a robust stability in our society and not due to negative but uncertain eventualities prematurely give up the right to freedom of expression. <clears throat> but the discussion will go on. I leave it by that. <clears throat> then. <clears throat> The second uh, main uh, limitation to freedom of expression, that of offense. Utterances that offend someone else may count as, and rightly so, cases where freedom of expression can be legally limited. This applies to serious cases where someone is severely offended, insulted, injured by certain utterances. However, in modern liberal democracies, this applies only to living persons, not to the dead, not to theories, not to traditions and cultures, not to confessions or religions. It applies to living persons as a defense of their self-feeling identity and autonomy. Nevertheless, a hard and persistent criticism of the cultural background of certain groups of living people may seriously offend the group members and do harm to, their, to them as autonomous persons. However, in cases of offense and insult, what matters is not only what is said, asserted, but also how it is added. The how is important. And the same questions can be, the same question can, uh, assertion can be uttered either aggressively or with respect and sympathy. The place is also important. Moreover, it's reasonable to distinguish between utterances that are that, uh, for which we are accidentally and involuntarily exposed, as in advertising and propaganda, and those which we seek voluntarily and with a personal effort, for instance, in books and magazines. The Muhammad Khatoums in Yulang's Posten belong to the latter. 
Recently, new technologies and social media have rev uh, revolutionized the whole field. More people take part freely without the filter of an editor. Hence, the atmosphere has become more implacable and crude with frequent insults and offenses. However, there is a problem here. Since a claim of being offended by certain utterances may function as a power strategy, as a trump card that kills the debate. Consider the proposal of the, in the uh, uh, in United Nations, raised by state with a Muslim rule, to ban criticism of religion, because. This criticism is said to offend the prophets, the Quran, and the feelings of Muslims. No more discussion. The claim that certain utterances offend other people is an ambiguous one. Hence, it is vital to care for a precise language. That again. Here we shall just consider two interpretations, two notions that ought to be kept apart. First, offense by utterances that are provocative and cause bad feelings, anger, grief, rage. Second, offenses by utterances that break down the autonomy of other persons through brainwashing, indoctrination, manipulation, harassment. The first sense, offense. So this former notion of offense, in for this notion, emo, notion, yeah, emotions and feelings are decisive. For example, consider the following quotation from the former prime minister of Norway, Jens Stoltenberg, in the response to the violence in the Muslim world after the publication of the Muhammad cartoons in Jyllands Post in the autumn of 2005. And I quote, it is important that we respect the feelings first of other people, end of quotation. However, feelings first are ambiguous phenomena. There are, for instance, distinctions to be drawn between sensations, feelings, and moods sensations, feelings, and moods, where the latter two are co-determined in different ways by social and cultural factors. In short, sensations are given physically, physiologically, or otherwise, whereas feelings and moods are dependent on cultures and traditions, or religious or other convictions that are not shared by everyone. Moreover, some of our feelings and moods may depend on our own understanding of a particular situation, or on our own feelings about controversial religious and metaphysical questions. In other words, in some cases, but not in all, we are co-responsible for our feelings and moods either because we should have avoided certain situations and not taken part in certain activities, or because we should have behaved in a more mature and enlightened manner as to our own attitudes and convictions. To put it plainly, those who feel offended and injured by utterances from other persons should not always have the weak to write in such cases. In short, we should not always have respect for the feelings of other persons. Second notion of offense. Offense here is that of degradation and humiliation of other persons by breaking down their personal autonomy, either by explicit harassment and disregard or by manipulation and indoctrination. As for the latter, consider advertising on the market and strategic communication in politics, as well as religious preaches aimed at the specific 
personal formation of other human beings, perhaps particularly of children. Freedom of religion, yes, for the educators, for the preachers, but what about those who are educated in this way? What about the children? They are, in some cases, brainwashed without the possibility of independent reflection and personal autonomy at the later stage when they get older. This is an important point which is often overlooked in the ongoing discussion on freedom of expression and freedom of the religion. Here are two statements of Ludwig Holberg, the scholar and philosopher of the early 18th century, my uh, translation. First quote, children should become human before they become Christians. But one begins to dig into divine catechisms whereby each person persistently defends the sect in which he was reared and is thus insensitive to other arguments at the later stage. End of quotation. Second quote. Therefore, whoever learns theology <coughs> before he has learned to be a human being will never be a human being. End of quotation. Certainly, certainly, children are always raised within some specific social cultural environment. The problem arises when these socialization processes take the form of an indoctrination that undermines their personal autonomy. Surely, this is not the problem in culturally modern, for culturally modern believers. I will understand that not the problem for culturally modern believers, as it used to be in Western Europe. But for those who are not culturally modern in the modern world, it is a problem. These points about manipulation and brainwashing are not of secondary importance. To break down the personal autonomy of another human being through verbal manip ma manipulation and indoctrination is often regarded as a deadly, as a, mortal, as a mortal sin, and rightly so. In many ways, this is worse than utterances that lead to anger and rage. Moreover, we recall that to offend the autonomy of another human being is to attack, an attack on the very normative foundation of freedom of expression, as I have defined it here, and as it is defined in the Norwegian Constitution, paragraph 100, and I quote second sentence, no person may be held liable in law for having imparted or received information, ideas, or messages, unless this can be justified in relation to the grounds for freedom of expression, here it comes, which are the seeking for truth, the promotion of democracy, and the individual's freedom to form opinions some final remarks. This normative notion of legal, of legal protection of the freedom of expression has, in my view, its peculiar strength. It includes, does not exclude, but includes the balancing of various values and concerns. But this is done on the background of a normative conception of freedom of expression as a presupposition of these three basic modern institutions that I mentioned, truth-seeking, deliberative democracy, and individual autonomy. Hence, this notion may serve as a norm by which various values and concerns can be examined and weighed in the courts, and also as a meta-norm prescribing basic normative requirements for future legislation. These points are not merely theoretically important. Firstly, the demand for a strong and universal justification for freedom of expression is particularly important in certain, certain political situations. For instance, for the discussion on the relationship between legal conceptions in the West and in other traditions, for instance, Chinese and Muslim. The importance for such cross-cultural dialogues and discussions, looking for a common ground, 
was realized already at the time of the Rashti case. Secondly, these discussions are also important since they open for an awareness of some basic conceptual distinctions, like the one between communicative and discursive utterances on the one hand and strategic and instrumental ones on the other. In other words, we do not only obtain a justification of a legal defense of freedom of expression in terms of this analysis of uh, uh, presuppositions for modern institutions, we also get distinctions Discussions uh, about more or less appropriate notions, such as interpretations of freely relevant offense. Summing up, it is my claim that this conception of a legal defense of freedom of expression gives a fair normative justification and also some fruitful notions when dealing with practical issues. However, this paper deals with the legal protection of freedom of expression. We do not, we have not addressed the various social challenges of freedom of expression, such as control within professional and social groups, the loyalty expectations and moral sanctions, or the power of money in the media and in the market, as well as in the relation to politics and politicians. In this paper, the focus, we have focus on the legal protection of freedom of expression as a necessary, not as a sufficient condition for free, it's truth seeking, uh, deliberative democracy, and personal autonomy. For surely, there are also a need for freedom of assembly, freedom of organization as necessary conditions legally and in reality. Moreover, there are social, economic, and political conditions, such as a common educational school system, decent working conditions, basic social security, and moderate socioeconomic differences. In short, a legal protection of freedom of expression alone will not do. Taken alone, without various other conditions, Legally free discussions may turn out to be quite powerless or go astray or even lead to conflicts and polarization. Nevertheless, especially in a time of global crisis and serious challenges, it is imperative to promote a universal normative justification of, legal, of the legal protection of freedom of expression. The alternative is self-defeating. Okay. Thank you very much.